Hello and welcome to the first episode of Inside Zone. I'm your host, Lucas Panzika. Excited to start this new venture with you as the goal of this podcast is to bring you inside the 104.5 The Zone studio. Some really fascinating people work in this building and I just want to bring you their origin stories, their journeys to get to this point. So when thinking about our first guest, I thought, all right, who do people know? Who do people just gravitate towards that we need to start this podcast off of? And I couldn't think of anybody better than the 2003 SEC Player of the Year, 14-year pro, and co-host of 3HL from 3 to 6 p.m. Central on 104.5 The Zone, Ron Slay. What's That's up, Slay? Good. That's pretty good right there, Pan. It seemed like you worked on that. <laughs> Thought about it a little bit. We kept you in mind here, too. We lifted the chair a little bit. Are you yeah, nice and cool. snug? You yeah, little co- you should lift yours up higher. We, we considered bringing in the couch for you and then hopefully Ramon Foster down the road. But, hey, are we going to do a double duty? Uh, we'll talk about it. We'll talk about it. So hey. like, when I thought about it, I like that. when I thought about starting this podcast, I thought yeah. about the Music City Bowl. Right. This past December, 2021, yeah. Tennessee and Purdue at Nissan Stadium. Right. I'm sitting in the south end zone mm-hmm. with, you know, my, one of my buddies, my girlfriend, and, and you and Buck Rising are down on the field. <laughs> yeah. And and you, you turn around and you see us, yeah. you know, right there behind the end zone, and you're yeah. waving at us. And then yeah. you guys come up to the stands and That's you right. kind of – Weave your way into the seats where we're yeah. sitting, and and we all go up to the concourse behind us. And mm-hmm. as we walk up there, people just—it's like it's like the Pied Piper. The way people <laughs> kind of follow you around, and just yeah. the party sort of goes where you go. And they're shouting, "I'm in the building!" And the car yeah. got no roof, yeah. and getting pictures and buying <laughs> drinks. Yeah. But I, it made me wonder: like, has that almost always been that way for you? Like before the the Tennessee playing days, before being in Europe, before being on the radio in Nashville. Like little Ron Slay, not your son, little you, <laughs> yeah. walking around in Nashville when you're a kid and in high school. Has it always kind of been that way for you? You know what, man? Um, I don't know if it's always been that way. I've always been um, attracted to a good time, though, whether it be um, sports, whether it be in church, whether it be at school, whatever it may be. I was always attracted to people having a good time, you know what I mean? Smiling and, you know, cheering and trying to motivate other people. So, um, I was fortunate um, growing up here in Nashville. My mom worked at Tennessee State University. Um, and she was coaching cheerleading at the time. She was cheerleading and volleyball coach. So I was around a lot of um, a really good a really good group of guys uh, when it came to Tennessee State University. You know, with, with Anthony Mason being there and um, being a ball boy for his teams, and then after. He left, and Carlos Rogers, that regime came in. Carlos Rogers, Daryl Wilson, Coach Frankie Allen, all these guys, and I was still a ball boy. So a lot of guys that were successful in our era, coming into high school, going into college, and then being able to play professionally, all kind of started right there at Tennessee State over there at the Gentry Center. So, so is that how Ron Slay fell in love with basketball? Yeah, without question, without question. Um, I used to get up. Um, I was staying with my grandmother at the time in Chattanooga, so. I would come up for the summers. Um, Coach Fitzgerald, Maurice Fitzgerald, had a team, a junior pro team. It was called Junior Pro. We used to play at Maplewood High School Saturday mornings. So I would come up after school on Friday um, in the spring before the summer hit and play with um, the Maple, what were we, the junior, Maplewood Tigers. The Junior Pro, we were the Tigers. We had two teams, the older team, the Bears, then the younger team, the Tigers. The older team consisted of um, Buck Fitzgerald, um, uh, Big John, Andre Stalin, all these guys that you know that, that went on to have good careers. Um, and then the younger team was guys like me, Little Marcus Fitzgerald. Um, well, not Little Marcus Fitzgerald. Marcus Fitzgerald Sr., the dad whose son plays at TSUs now. Um, but Michael Clay Brooks, we all, all were together. So I would get on the bus, Greyhound bus, if he didn't come pick me up. Greyhound bus. Probably about 11, 12 years old, ride up here. Uh, maybe might have been younger than that. <laughs> um, play on the team, go back Sunday, start the whole process back over until the summertime came. Then I come up here with my mom, um, chill for the summer. Mind you, she was still in school, finishing up her, uh, her degree. So um, that was the reason me playing, staying in Chattanooga. So get on the bus, come up here in the summer, stay up here the whole summer get um, acclimated to everything, NYSP program, which they don't have. Well, I don't think they have anymore, not in Nashville anyway, but that was a real good program that had everybody in one space being at the Gentry Center on TSU campus. So 
that was my thing, man. So you've got roots in, in Middle Tennessee, in East Tennessee, in West Tennessee. Yeah, all over. You're a national native, and I know you're proud of that, and yeah. everybody knows that about right. you. But not a lot of people, I don't think, know that you were actually born in Memphis. Yeah. And you yeah. hate Memphis basketball more yeah. than anybody I know. Can't stand the city of Memphis. So when, when did that move happen? <laughs> yeah. What's your relationship um, with the city of Memphis? So like? my pops, my pops' side of the family is from West Tennessee. That's where the relation comes with me and Ramon. Um, um, I was... Well, we were down there. We were down there in Covington. So his part of the family um, is from Covington, Tennessee, um, which is probably about 45 minutes um, from Memphis. So when I was about to be born, we were down there, and I had to go to Memphis to be born. So I was born in Memphis, came back to Covington after. I think we stayed there a couple of months with my uh, grandfather and grandmother, um, and then shot on, shot on back to Nashville. You know, and um, that was my extent uh history with memphis so a couple of months you know what i mean that's all they got from me you know what <laughs> i mean they, they couldn't taint me they couldn't taint my soul but yeah man it was it's, it's cool to have uh family from west tennessee too like you know you got the countryside you know what i mean covington my grandfather's real influential down there weary dyson um and you know the dyson name um he, he's made a legacy that you can stand on to be proud of down there um big guy probably about we were probably granddaddy probably about six six, six six and a half. Big old man, man. Like don't play that. You know what I'm saying? Like, man, a, a self made man. You know what? Uh, what? Um, auto body shop. He had the uh, the juke joint out back. He raced horses. Um, he had his own farm. Like it was. He had everything you want to be. You know what I'm saying? When you look at him. So I, I I was fortunate to have that side of the family. Then when you go to East Tennessee and Chattanooga. Uh, when I came back, my other grandfather on my mom's side, it was pretty much the same thing. The only thing different was the stature. You know what I'm saying? Both well, my 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 mom's grand, my mom's dad was way shorter. He's probably about five, seven, five, eight. You know what I mean? So um, I would say I got my height and stuff from my, my pop side of the family. But <laughs> well, regardless of the stature, both of them ruled with an iron fist. You know what I'm saying? And Taught a lot of discipline. Yes, sir. No, sir. It is what it is. And you got to be able to get out here and get it on your own. So fast forward to high school, Pearl Cone. Yeah. You're playing football. You play basketball. Yeah. Everybody knows you were teammates with John Henderson. Obviously, Tennessee NFL legend. Uh, What's his presence like on a high school football field? Sheesh, man. Big John. What's Okay, let me let me paint a picture for you. Um, This is when I knew Big John was Big John. Um. I think it was my sophomore year. Um, we had just – have we already won state? We hadn't won the state yet. But uh, we may have won the state. But his senior year or his junior year, this was before they outlawed the smoke visors. So he had the mirror smoke visors. Um, they picked that up from Miami, University of Miami. <laughs> So our guys, we would come out in all black. I forgot who we were playing. It was the first game of the season. Big John didn't come out and warm up. So everybody else out there warming up, you know, everybody stretching, doing their thing. You know, we got our clap going, boom, boom, <laughs> everything's good, you know. So we go back in the locker room after stretching, and we come out. Now, the way they lined up, we're going shortest to tallest. So Big John, of course, is in the back. But I'm somewhere lingering around back there, you know what I'm saying? Um, but we walk out. We come out in a single file line. Once we make it to the field, I happen to look back. I don't know what made me look back, but I happen to look back and I saw him. <laughs> and boy, whoo, this man had a collar on his pads with his, his all black uniform on, with the, the helmet on, straps not buckled. And it was some, I don't know, was the moonlight or the light from the stadium that hit this dude. And I automatically knew this dude different, man. Now, what, this, age, what age are we? This was about? I was I was probably about sixteen. And so John is what? John is seventeen, okay. eighteen at the time. He was two years ahead of me. So, but I'm looking at him, man, like, this ain't human right here, man. And you could feel it when we walked out on the field, like from when we were warming up, like we had some dudes that were hitting the weights, hitting the weights, jacked up, you know, it's gonna tattoo you when you run out there. Man, them guys looking at us, man, and there was a little bit of fear. But when we came back out with John, nah, Big Joe was different, man. Like, you could feel them. Like, the game was over before we even took the field. Just by them looking at him, man, it was a, this dude's presence. He was already 6'8". 
put the cleats on him. The man looking like 6'9", 6'10". <laughs> this one, they were spatting the ankles, so he spat it all the way up. Like, man, this, the jerk, his stomach showing. It ain't, it's flat. Like, you looking at this big human being like, dude, what is this dude going to do? And then when he get out there, he moving quicker than any lineman, you know what I mean, any linebacker, any safety, running backs, whatever it may be. He's one of the fastest dudes on the field. So to see a mammoth of a man move that bit, that, that fast, man, and be that intimidating and then be able to back it up and play every down, it was special. The slap routine. We've all it, seen it yeah. with the Jaguars <laughs> in the locker yeah. room before the game, getting a right. poor, terrified trainer to <laughs> smack him around before he right. gets on the field. Right. How far back does that go? Do you remember? Dude? Man, I don't, he started that when he got to the league. Okay. Yeah, he didn't. There, ain't no way. First, first of all, man, you got to be crazy to be trying to slap John. You know what I mean? But I did ask him, and he but when told John me. John tells you to slap John. You yeah, like, yeah, John. yeah, yeah, but I, no, nah, Joe, it's I'm not going to do it. No, nah, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, but I will say, he said the trainer's hands are real tiny. He said, so that's where it started. He said one day he was in the game, I mean, getting ready for a game, and he just couldn't get his juices flowing. So he told the trainer to slap him. And the trainer was like, nah, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I don't want to do that. So he said, nah, come on, slap me. It's going to be cool. I ain't going to do nothing. So he slapped him, and that's when it, it all started. Nah, dude, that ain't hard enough. He was like, because one of them, he had little tiny hands. He said, <laughs> so he made him slap him hard. He said, one time he did catch him, though, and uh, busted his lip a little bit, but he said he was cool, so he was in the moment. But, yeah, now nah, we we weren't slapping Big Joe. But we had some dudes on our team, though, that was rough and yeah. tough. Tyrese Lawless, Kenneth Gates, Tyrone Hodge. But, like, that defense, man, I'm going to be honest, that, that defense rival – Anything you ever seen in high school, all the way to um, what's the the documentary done? The movie was Varsity Blues, but it was um it was about the school, the team that they played from Dallas when they lost the game. Um, was it, it was Friday Night Lights? Friday Night Lights. Lights. Yeah. Friday Night Lights. They played the team from Dallas. <clears throat> the team that Permian plays in the movie. Yes. Yeah. So the Dallas team was serious in real life, like cold blooded. Mm -hmm. So you got to look at. Do your history on them. I believe our team rivaled that team without question. If you look it up, that Dallas team, I can't remember the name, but that Dallas team was serious, dude. A lot of them dudes going D1 and everything. So, apparently, man, they were supposed to lose. But um, Dallas, that Dallas team, that's the only team I've seen that I would say, man, that's that rivals our high school. People listen to this podcast probably screaming at their phones or, or cars right now about yeah. the name of that high school. Yeah, and it's cool. I, I can't even think of it. But, boy, hey, woo, they got some dog. They got in trouble. They had guys run. Man, it's, it's really interesting. I ain't going to give too much um, light to it. But they they were running around, man. They were robbing Wendy's and stuff like that, <laughs> going to play on the field. Like, it it was crazy. It's a story you got to look into, man. It's a story you got to look into. And you'll see why Perryman lost the game. So – I know you transferred to Oak Hill, and then obviously mm. that leads to to playing college basketball at Tennessee. But you loved your football playing days. Yeah, uh, and you question. talk about it all the time. But when did you know that basketball was your future, or did you always know? And was um, football just something that, that my you junior year, my junior year, um, we were we were coming off winning the state championship. <clears throat> I was gonna have a bigger role in the next year, um, playing wide receiver. We just got a new quarter, uh, quarterback. Um, he could really air it out. No knock on Buck Fisher. Buck Fisher was more of a running option type quarterback um, and just a hell of a leader, man. So um, we had a new quarterback in, and I was out there practicing all summer. Me and Damian Harris, man, my man Precious, man, over at Pearl Cone now. We practicing all summer. One, me and him out there throwing fades, goals, stops, ins, outs, like, Hitches, I'm I'm all I'm on it, man. I'm ready. You know what I mean? I got my weight up. Like I'm a, I got a picture I had to show you from my sophomore year going into my junior year. It's two totally different people. I was probably 175, soaking wet my sophomore year. Then going into my junior year, I was probably about 205, 200 pounds, you know what I mean? But I've been lifting weights, so I am ready. We're going to scrimmage Oakland. Oakland. Really good team. You know, the county schools were really good at that time. Yeah, still are. Yeah, still are. Mm -hmm. So that's what it was about. It was about representing the public school, going to see one of them. Oh, we getting it on. And then people thought we – it was a fluke. We won the uh, state championship. So we on a mission. Man, we get out there. We're going kind of like 7-on-7. Seven seven. Um, Danny Perry dropped back, throw me the ball. I go up, catch the ball. 
when I catch it, now nobody's never taught me this. So kids, if you're listening, pay attention to this. You got to learn how to fall. I didn't know how to fall. So I went up, caught the pass, tucked it, came down, put my arm down to break my fall, and my wrist snapped. Mm. So the adrenaline's still pumping. I'm like, I'm having a good preseason. We're in the summer now, the dog days. I done made it through conditioning. Ain't no way I'm stopping. So my wrist is, I still got it right now. I got two cuts right here. I got a plate and four screws in it. I'm still in it to this day. But I go to back to the huddle. I run back to the huddle. Because I'm like, golly, it hurt. Run back to the huddle. And I'm on the way back, I'm trying to push it up. Like, you know what I mean? I don't really know it's broke because it ain't set in. Like, no pain or anything. It's just, it's hanging. It's like a little you. You know what I mean? So <laughs> I'm trying to push it up. And when I get back, they look at it and they touch it. And I'm like, oh, I can feel it now. It's yeah. starting to set in. I was like, hey, man, just tape it up. Tape it up. So they put some tape on it, and, man, I, I I couldn't go no more. Like, I couldn't move it or anything. So that right there, they put me out for about six, I think about six weeks. Um, I had a cast on, then they put me in the splint. And right then, man, it was like the season had started. I think we were two or three games in, and they were such on the road, dude. It was like, man, they don't really need me. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, look at this defense. Like, this John and them senior year. Kenneth Gates and them, man. And then you got Santonio Beard back there running that rock like James Pratt at the time, J.R. Pratt. J.R. Pratt is the one who pulled the fire alarm. So anybody, J.R., you the one did it. But <laughs> this, let me tell you this. J.R. is out there receiver. He's out there safety. Santonio at corner. Cedric Wilson at corner at receiver. Santonio running the ball. Like, everything's covered. I was just going to be an addition. You know, mm -hmm. I wasn't going to make that huge of a fact. It was just another weapon, you know. So I'm looking at it like, man. After watching it, I'm like, dude, I, I ain't no need me getting back out there, man. You know what I'm saying? Like basketball right around the corner. And then this would have been my first season being able to start basketball early because, you know, when football runs into basketball, you really yeah. come in the middle of the year. So I was like, man, you know what? Forget it, man. I'm just going out here and hoop. And it kind of just transitioned on its own that way, man. So. so how does that lead into the recruitment process? And Jerry Green recruiting you to Tennessee. <laughs> was it always Tennessee? is my first question. And mm -hmm. then second of all, if it's not, how does Jerry Green get you to Knoxville? Nope, it wasn't It wasn't always uh, Tennessee. It was um, actually a couple of my first letters. One was from Arkansas, one was from Memphis. Um, and Memphis at that time had, you know, a good stature about itself. You know, I, I was kind of feeling Memphis, you know. And so we're talking 1999. Yeah, right? yeah, 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 yeah. 96, 90, somewhere around there. I think that's when I started getting recruited, 96, 97. So, you know, Penny had just left Memphis. Mm -hmm. David Vaughn, who's from Weiss Creek, had went down there. Mingo Johnson, um, a Nashville legend, had went there. So I was I was kind of an eye on Memphis. I loved Arkansas. I loved the way they played. And that was some of my first letters. You know, Kevin O'Neill had reached out. He was the coach at Tennessee at the time. Um, I think with a questionnaire. They might have sent me a questionnaire or something. But everybody else they um, I was into is the coach signing it at the bottom. You know, so Nolan, Coach Nolan Richardson had signed it whoever the coach was at uh, Memphis, but it was more about the school at that time. So those were some of my first letters, man, and I was – Corliss Williamson, that, that did it for me. Arkansas, I was I was on I was on Arkansas. You know, I never thought about Kentucky at all um, at that point. But um, the recruiting really picked up. Kevin O'Neill left UT. Jerry Green came in. Um, coach Cutcliffe was, regard, uh, was recruiting Big John. Oh, man, we came in, a, him and Coach Fisher walked through the gym. We were just playing pickup one day. They were walking through the gym to get to the weight room, go to the football part of it. And um, Coach Cliff and them had stood and watched. Now, I ain't had no clue who, they, who, who he is. You know, I just know some white guy walking Coach Fisher. Right. I don't know who he is. You know, he got some Tennessee gear on. It's cool. It ain't Coach Formal. So, right. I don't know who it is. But um, he, had, um, he had asked Coach Fisher, and I saw them stop and talk for a second while we were out there playing. And um, apparently he asked him who I was, you know, and uh, when he, after he met with Big John and all and went back to Knoxville, he told Coach Ferguson, Chris Ferguson at the time, hey, man, y'all need to get down there and recruit him, you know. So that's when it all started. Um, and they picked up into my sophomore year, going into my junior year, picked up real heavy in my junior year. And um, mind you, I'm still flying kind of under the radar at this time. We're on the map for football more so than basketball, even though we got a good team. Um, basketball in the state of Tennessee has always been about Memphis. 
You know, so we were kind of overshadowed outside of the big stars and Ron Merson, David Vaughn, and guys like that, Dante Jones and people like that. So that's where mine picked up at, man. And then the rest was history. And you get there a year after they win the national championship. Mm -hmm. I know you're tight with a lot of those guys yep. that were on the football team at the time. Right. But that is an interesting dynamic to be playing basketball during that time of yeah. Tennessee football. What's the best memory that you look back on with your experience at Tennessee? Is it the Sweet 16 run in 2000? Is it kind of your big breakout senior year, right? SEC player of the year season. Like, what's the first thing that comes to mind? First thing that comes to mind is um, me going to Oak Hill Academy, um, us coming down for a visit, um, a team visit, and we came down on the Florida game. They were playing Florida in 98 and them beating Florida, everybody storming the field. Um, all I remember is a seal orange, the goalpost coming down, and me trying to jump over the wall to get on, get on the field to it. Coach Smith wouldn't let me jump over the wall. <laughs> Coach Smith was like, uh-uh, slay dog, you can't go down there. I'm like, oh, man, come on, man. So once we get in the van, I'm telling Coach Smith, hey, man, I'm going there. Like, it ain't down. You ain't got to tell me you don't want to. I'm going there, dude. Like, that's, that sold me. I'd already early committed before going to, verbally committed before going to Oak Hill. But um, I was like, man, that did it for me. So we get back to Oak Hill, um, and we're going through the season and whatnot. And the only problem that I had with Tennessee at the time that almost made me flip was we didn't get – the coaches wasn't coming to see me. So – Gary Williams was, record, was, was recruiting uh, Steve Blake, so he had already verbally committed to Maryland. Uh, Travis Watson was uh, being recruited by Virginia. Pete Gillen was coming down there all the time. Tubby Smith was recruiting. Um, this when Tubby and them coming out fresh off a national championship was recruiting our point guard Cliff Hawkins, who was a junior at the time. So he's up there, and I'm looking around like this by two weekends straight, and we up there hooping, and the coaches get to watch. I'm like, man. Why well, Tennessee ain't up here, man? You know what I mean? Like, see, they just think it, they got it easy with me. You know what I mean? So I told Coach Smith, hey, man, I think I want to go to Kentucky. You know what I mean? Because I'm I'm just liking the love. Tubby showing they fresh off a national championship. I can always see um, falling in the steps of uh, Ron Mercer a little bit. You know, that's the OG. So I'm like, man, I'll go to Kentucky then, you know. Ready to pull back on that. And um, he's like, no, you got to wait. Just give me a day, hold on, just go down there, sleep on it. So whatever happened between me sleeping on it uh, and the next day, um, um, Coach Green and all them guys came up and started showing me love. So I was like, all right, you know, sometimes you got to soothe him. Pass the time. Yeah, you got to soothe the baby. You got to pat his back a little bit. You know, <laughs> So they pat my back, you know, he made me feel better. So I uh, went on and enrolled with the Tennessee Commit. You hear stories about Pat Summit. Yeah. Uh, and I know you're very close with, with a lot of the Lady Vols players mm -hmm. that were there when you were there, obviously a national championship right. stretch for them while mm -hmm. you're in school. But mm -hmm. you hear stories about Pat Summit taking over practices for the men's team and running them just into oblivion, basically. And you hear stories about the Bruce Pearl era and him, you know, getting her to do that a lot. Yeah. Uh, do you have anything like that? Nah. Um, <laughs> uh, you know what? We were a different bunch. Um, we wasn't so welcoming of Coach Summit coming in and trying to run any of our practices and run us like that because she was different. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Like, we were, we were cool with Jerry Green. How Coach Green was going <laughs> to run it, like, that's cool. Let's Shirts and skins, let's go out here and hoop. Let's do what we got to do, go over the game plan. Let's get in and out, man. You know what I'm saying? Coach Summit going to be in there, man. Get on the line and out now, Coach. We Maybe and that's why we ain't got no banners hanging yeah. up. But, but, yeah, it was – um. One thing about her, man, um, I always look back on if it was one thing that I can pull from it. I remember having a conversation my going into my senior year, and I was kind of like we had lost a lot of guys with the coaching change, um, with them, you know, um, Harris Walker and Terrence Woods that got released from the team. Those were two of the freshmen that came in with us. When Buzz Peterson when takes Buzz over Peterson for Jerry Green. Up, right, yeah. um, going into my junior year. Um, but after that junior year, Marcus Hayslip had already bounced and went to the league. Vince went to the league. Um, Dale Baker was gone. So it was kind of just me and John Higgins. We had C.J. Watson coming in. But at the time, we didn't know him. you know. And I, um, so I'm coming off of ACL as well. So I'm like, man, I don't know how I'm going to do this, man. This is, And I, I caught in the um, hallway, and she gave me some words of motivation. So it would be little times like that you'll spend yeah. where – 
you know, you just kind of keep you pushing. Um, I also asked her one time, I'll never forget, just about the game of basketball, I always share this, that um, she was like, um, I was like, man, how do you, how do you get these runs going in the game, you know, and, and keep your, the team focused, like on the run, the task at hand. She was like, basketball is a game of runs. Everybody's gonna make their run. How quick can you stop them from making that run and you getting on your run? So I was like, I always remember that when I'm watching basketball, coaching basketball, playing basketball, whatever it may be, that's one that's always stuck out with me. You know, you never see her really going to panic mode when she coached. It was kind of, we're gonna do what we do. We're gonna keep our head down the grind. And and that was that was something I took from it. So whatever she told you when you're rehabbing from that ACL tear must have worked because <laughs> that's your big breakout season, right? Yeah. Over 21 points per game, yeah. almost eight rebounds per game, SEC Player of the Year, third team yeah. All-American. Huge season in right. your final year of college basketball. Mm -hmm. So what's your mindset going into the 2003 NBA draft? And you go <sighs> undrafted, but was it more of a stunned that you didn't get drafted or maybe – you knew that that would be a possibility. No, nah, it was stunned. Um, for the simple fact, man, I remember, um, like, so this was my idea. And you had, if you're an All-American, that was third-team All-American. Mm -hmm. That means you got 15 guys. It ain't like the like people do it now. You got a first team with 20 guys, second team with 20. You got to be top five on each team. So 15, I'm third team. Um, that means it's 15 guys or 14 guys better than me. You can put me at 15. If you're looking at the draft, regardless who's coming overseas or who's proven or whatever, these are the best guys at they at their craft. I'm one of those guys. So I'm like, okay, that's, I, I got to get drafted. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to go put in the work, do what I'm supposed to do, go to the uh, combine um, with Chicago. I was, I was actually shocked Chicago or Miami didn't take me. Um, I had a, one of the greatest workouts in Chicago, busting my tail. Um, and I want to say they took one of the guys. It might have been Tommy Smith. It was I know I was working out with a guy, Tommy Smith, and then a guy from Arizona State, and I was at the small forward spot. But the the funny thing about this workout, <clears throat> after we did the testing and everything, broad jump, vertical, weight room, we get out there on the court, we're playing one-on-one-on-one. -on -one -on -one. So we're going to five. Um, one guy standing in the half court, Whoever makes it keeps it. So while we're going, I think this might be tied one, one, one. Trent Housel, who was a teammate of mine, who was with the Bulls at the time, walks in. Now, when Trent walks in, it's um I'm automatically I go my dog because we got a we, we played AAU together mm -hmm. in high school. You know what I'm saying? He was on the bigger team. I was traveling. I was younger. Um, he was probably two years older than me. So when he walk in, him and what's my man, big Marcus Pfizer. Um, I think I'm saying his name right. Played at um, St. John's, I believe. Marcus Pfizer, they walk in. He was with the Bulls at the time. So when he come in, I could see it. He got a twinkle in his eye, you know. <laughs> you see his boy out there going to work. So I go off. Boom, boom, boom. I go off. I score the next four buckets. You know what I mean? And then on my last shot, I shoot it and fade back and holler out game. And Trent catch me. You know, it's like this is some some dream stuff for me. I'm in the Bulls facility mm -hmm. doing this. My dog walk in, so I killed it. You know, so I broke Pete Myers' record for some kind of little drill they had. Um, but killed that. I thought it was gonna be them in Miami. When it didn't happen, man, it was it was crushing. Mm -hmm. Like it was. You talking about one of the lowest points in my life? I I I really didn't know how to rebound. All I knew was. I got to pick up the pieces and, and push. You know what I mean? And I didn't know what form that looked in because all I knew was, man, if you work hard, you can get to where you got to get to, and ain't no ain't nobody can stop you. But I was somehow stopped, man. So that was that was a sick feeling, dude. That was a sick feeling to have to – we had a, a get-together at the Boys and Girls Club, Andrew Jackson Boys and Girls Club, which I grew up in, all the Boys and Girls Clubs uh, across Nashville and – um, we probably had about 35 people there, 40 people there, um, family and friends. And I was watching in a separate room. When the draft was over, I had to come out and face everybody and talk to them. And the, ironic, uh, the irony of this story is Brandon Wright was one of the kids sitting in there, you know, um, um, while I was talking. And he'll tell the story probably from a different perspective. Yeah, Brandon Wright, national yeah. native, North yeah. Carolina Tar Heel, mm -hmm. NBA standout, yeah, Phoenix and Memphis. Yeah. Without question. So, um, you know, 
we was kind of big brother role in that sense, you know. But um, I'm looking at I'm looking at them and looking at him like, I, everybody in the room like, hey y'all, uh, this ain't the end, you know what I mean? I appreciate all y'all coming out. This is the beginning of the journey, you know. And I said it, but man, I had the biggest the the, the frog in my throat was probably this big. I couldn't even swallow. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It was it was like somebody was choking me. I couldn't breathe. I don't even know how I was talking. You know what I mean? All I want to do was say my words and get out of there as quick as possible. So that was the that was one of the, the toughest times in my journey, man. And but I will say the resiliency that came from that created a monster. So So you didn't even have the thought in your mind of what if you go undrafted, what you're gonna <laughs> no. do next. And no. What that next move was was Turkey. Galatasaray. A <laughs> yeah, club so. in Turkey signs you over there. So, I, but I want to ask you the the front end of yeah. your European career because that kick starts a long mm -hmm. career overseas. Mm -hmm. The front end of that part of your career, how much of that is still fixed in doing what I can to get back to the states and maybe find another shot, or this is my new path and I'm moving forward, no looking back. Well, a, a lot of that was um, the only reason I ended up overseas was because I wanted to hurry up and get away from America. Like I didn't want to face anybody. I didn't want any questions asked. I didn't want to be walking out. Fresh and, start. Yeah, like you mind you, I'm I'm the life of the party. If I'm in a room, I don't care if I'm in a restaurant or well, I'm gonna light the room up. So when I walk in, I don't want to hear, hey man, what happened in the draft? Man, I don't know. You know what I mean? So I fired my agent, a guy that got me that contract. I forgot his name, man. Like he wasn't even my agent. I was just like, hey man, he said I gotta I gotta deal with Galatasaray over in Istanbul with Turkey. You wanna take it? Yes. Get me out of there. I signed 100000 And that was low ball. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? But I just wanted to hurry up and get me away. I don't care what it is. So I went over there. Um, best thing for me to get away, <clears throat> kind of be by myself, kind of get my thoughts together. Um, fell in love with the game again. I was kind of just playing. I was still in love with it, but I was more so just playing just to play. Once I got over there about a month, start dealing with everything you got to deal with overseas, so automatically clicked back with, Man, you got to do what you got to do to get back over in America and get in the NBA, you know. So that that started the process. So my years leading up, it was always for about four or five years. Play really hard during the season, get some money, go back and do summer league and try to get that, that next look in the NBA. Okay, so I have a list here. Long list. Yeah, long list. <laughs> Turkey, Israel, France, Bulgaria, Venezuela, Switzerland, Italy, Spain, Puerto Rico, Portugal. Am I missing any, or are any of those wrong? You said France? I said France, yes. I, said, I listed 10 countries that you <laughs> South played South America? In. Uh, Caracas, Venezuela? Ven yeah, I said Venezuela. Well, you That's all like, of them. Look like you got it I all. I did my man. research. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we've talked about your career overseas a lot, you yeah. and I, and the language barrier that you face. Mm -hmm. And it's not just going to Turkey and, okay, yeah. now i got to overcome the – it's it's Turkey and then France and then Portugal and then Italy. Yeah. It's different cultures and languages yeah. and and foods and yeah. playing styles. Yeah. And and you've always said to me basketball is universal. It is. But can you kind of expand like expand on that a little bit? When you say basketball is <laughs> universal, how mm -hmm. would you communicate with teammates, with opponents, with coaches that mm -hmm. don't speak the same language as you? Right. How do you communicate in basketball? See, with, when you say basketball is universal, really the terminology as far as the elbow. Um, the low block, the three-point line, the paint, out of bounds, like all of that is universal. And those are only pretty much the languages that these coaches know, and that's it. Like they really rely on the younger guys on the team. You have two or three guys on the team that are probably high school age that are in school, and they're, peak, they're learning English. So they will use them as translators most of the time. So they will probably learn years before I got there how to conversate or, or translate uh, the information you were trying to say. But as soon as you step off the court, after you get out of that 94, 94 foot box, it's over. Like, they don't know how to communicate. They don't know how to ask you how you're doing or anything. So that's the struggle. So once you get in the basketball gym, that's your safe haven. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's where you feel like you can communicate. And then also, I can go out here and really show you what I mean. You know, I can get out here and play, and I'm so good that – Whatever you don't understand, you need to be trying to find out what it is to make me happy on this court because I'm going I'm to I'm perform for you. You know what I'm saying? So um, 
that's the, the 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 biggest thing, man, was outside of the game. But the basketball game itself, it was simple, man. Like if you got an IQ, you can make it. If you you understand um the knowledge of basketball, you can pretty much make it. You know, it's it's it's, it's simple. You just gotta go out there and do your job and understand that it is a business and doing your job is a part of it. But Outside of it, that's the most difficult thing. Trying to find what you're gonna eat, going in the grocery stores, reading these labels, you ain't understanding the milk coming in different cartons and whoo, then you gotta start cooking on your own. You gotta it's, it's it's crazy. And then you gotta imagine. I went over there in 03. Internet ain't popping. Mm-hmm. It ain't, none of that's going down. You know, ain't no dial up, it ain't man, you gotta go get calling cards. Real life calling cards at a kiosk or Anywhere that you can find it, scratch it off, man, you probably get a 500-minute calling card. As soon as you call the states, them 500 minutes only work 24 minutes. It's like, dude, you would probably spend $30 on the card. So you spent, hey, man, I'm talking about a journey. <laughs> it's different. And I know that, that all of those, you talk about Italy being the best experiences. Yeah. And, and I bring that up pretty shortly after we met. Yeah. Uh, you told me a story about signing with, and the club was Junior Casale yeah. in 2006, yep. signing yep. with them in a suite at an AC Milan game yep. because the owner of that club was on the board of directors mm-hmm. of AC Milan. Yep. And that struck me because I grew up a, a big AC Milan fan. Yep. I thought that was the coolest thing in the world. Yep. But I bring that up because I wanted to tell you, that, that team played in a town called Casale Monferrato. Yeah. That's an hour and that's a hour and nineteen minute drive from the town of Carmagnola, where my father grew up. Oh, really? And I spent so much of my childhood in the summers and winters <laughs> visiting family every For single real? year. Literally less than an hour and a half away from that's where you crazy. played in Casale Monferrato. So I, I bring that up though because I know about sporting in Italy, about mm-hmm. sports and, and soccer and the command it has mm-hmm. over the fans and the passion yep. that the fans have for soccer in Italy. Yep. How much of that translated to basketball? A, a lot of it. Um, and you don't understand it until you get over there. Like, I thought Turkey, when I went to Turkey, the, the club I signed with Galatasaray mm-hmm. was a big club in football. Yeah. Um, a lot of the teams you played yeah. for, big soccer, <clears throat> right. Benfica in Portugal as well. It was exactly. So you had them, you had Uc- it was, there was Uca, uh Galatasaray, and Fenerbahce. Those were the big teams. Bishitash came a little bit later in, mm-hmm. in Turkey. But all of them had great football teams. So if you got good football teams – that's going to trickle down to your basketball, having a good situation going on. Um, Italy, and that's just the top four teams in Turkey. Italy, first division, second division, third division, in soccer or basketball, man, it's going to trump everything. Like, of course, soccer is good. Football is going to, it's going to handle it. But when you get to the next level in basketball, it's as much love shown in basketball as it is in football because – most of those teams have football teams, and they follow, so they just trickle down to the basketball. Man, I didn't know it was that serious until the first game. I'm playing in the second division at Consali, and I go out. The first game I don't play, the guy I'm coming to replace is on the floor. I, they got me. This is how cutthroat it is. They got me. They done flew me over. I'm sitting in the stands watching the guy play his last game that I'm about to take his spot, and – it's just weird to know, like, he got to go out there and give it his all, but he know he about to get up out of here, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? So, and the crowd was rocking. That was my first introduction. Man, it was probably about 4,500 people in there, 3,500, somewhere between 3,500 and 4,000 4, people. Packed, screaming, just like at the soccer games. Mind you, I hadn't experienced the soccer game yet. Mm-hmm. So that's all I know is the basketball. Dude, when I seen that, man, then when I went and signed, and it was, I want to say it was AC Milan playing inner. Uh, that day, dude, that was different. Like, thought as good of a game as you can go dude, to. Dude, yeah, yeah. And I, mind you, I don't even know what I'm really seeing. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, oh, this is a little soccer game. You know, it's <laughs> crazy outside, this, that, and the other. But I, after I was over there, I was like, darn, dude, that was because I only went to one more after that. You know what I mean? But to know that um, they love the sport like that, it's, it's second to none, dude. And you, you, that's what I loved about Italy, like the passion that they show for everything, for family, for food, for sports, whatever it may be, friendship. It's all passion, dude. And that's what I'm used to in the South. You know, yeah. coming from the SEC, that was the that was the most that was the thing that 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 
that mirrored the SEC most when I was the time I was in Italy. Because being in France, uh, to me, there was wine and cheese, crowd, they eye, clapping and all that. Get on out of here, man. <laughs> Italy, then. Uh, uh, I had my own chills and everything, dude. L-L-L-A, Ron Slay. Yeah, you feel me? Yeah. I had that one, and I had the, um, I had like the Flintstone chill. It was um, Slay, Ron or Slay. Uh, then I say something in Italian, but you know, but, hey man, it was cold, man. It was cold. I'm gonna be real. So you retire in 2016. Uh, yeah, I ain't officially retired either, Pam. Oh, you're not retired yet. No, I'm just I okay. Just, sorry, I misspoke. <laughs> no, nah, but <laughs> it was. I know it was always media for you. Yeah, right. I know that. I mean that that those roots go back to when you were a kid. You have right. told me. I know at Tennessee, you know, right. sitting down with Bob Kessling mm-hmm. and Ball Network about mm-hmm. how to deal with the media and, yeah. and them telling you, no, Slate, you're good. Yeah, you got it. Yeah. Um. What were your goals in media after you leave Europe, you come back home in 2016, or was it simply just get out there as much as you possibly can? Man, I really was – I was trying to go the coaching route, man. You know, I wanted to come back, finish my degree at UT, um, getting my, my foot in, whether it be doing a GA job or whatever it is. And then I had the opportunity to go back to um, – come here at Innsworth. Coach Bowers and David Whitfield gave me an opportunity to come over there and coach. And um, that was my that was my thing, doing some coaching, man. And then – um, I went, I was about to graduate at Tennessee and it went, I went through like a little media cycle, um, people interviewing and wanting to talk to me and everything. And then I sat down one day with, um, nine, what, what is it? 99.1 FM. Um, my the sports station. animal. Yeah. Sports yeah. Animal, yeah. Mm-hmm. With Heather and Josh. Um, it was Heather and Tyler at the time before she moved with Josh. Um, and they interviewed me. One morning, about a 20 minute interview, <clears throat> and it went good. And Heather was like, Hey, man, you ought to think about jumping in this and doing this. And I'm like, Man, Heather, I don't, I don't know. I mean, this fun, this fun as yeah. hell, but you know, I don't, who gonna give me a shot? She was like, Man, let me see if we can do something. And they set it up, and we started the sleigh ride segment. So, still going today? It's still going today. Every yeah. Tuesday, right? Every Tuesday, yeah. So, that was, that was my first dive into it. And once she said that, I came back here and was like trying to figure out, What's the next move? And um, man, you get turned away a lot. You know what I'm saying? You get turned away a lot. So somehow, I, I made my own avenue. Um, thanks to Garth Bolden, man, Gateway Tires, my man, um, took me to a radio station, Miss Linda, and them. They gave me my shot. This was um, ooh, W A K M. W A K M. There you go. Come on, man. Pan, you on your, you on your research game, I mean, what, baby. Yeah. What do you think we're doing here? Yeah. <laughs> so a W A K M, man, and. Dude, I had to go out and get, I had to buy my own time slot, go out and get me sponsorships in order to pay for the time slots. Mm-hmm. Like, it was it was a grind. And you had to deal with being laughed at. You know what I'm saying? Like, ah, oh, look at me over on a little AM station, you know what I'm saying? But every Friday, five to six, I was in there faithfully, you know what I mean? Doing it, doing my own research, running my own show. I had an hour show with one commercial. You know what I mean? So I'm talking the whole way through it. You know, Tennessee basketball, Tennessee football, going about that, going and getting guests and all that. And that was it, man. That that, that catapulted it into whatever it is today, man. So, yeah, man, that, those are the people that gave me my shot, jumped off on the podcast, the Boom Boom Room, went off on it, got some, got my feet wet doing that. But um, 9.50 a.m., W-A-K-M at 99.1. FM was the only people. But this is the thing. When they shutting the doors in your faces and laughing at you about what you're doing, man. And I, one thing I never do is forget. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. on the back end, y'all better be ready. Y'all, y'all better be ready. I'm coming for you. But I will say, man, it was some of the people that that you look at in this business. And you're like, dang. When you can, when they can use you. It's all good, you know what I'm saying? But as far as giving you a platform to trampoline off of, like, what happened to that? What happened to reaching back and grabbing? Mm-hmm. That's why if anybody called me or asked me anything, man, I'm pointing in the right direction or whatever because, man, I, I never forget, man, I was on the show. I was on the show, and I said the Boom Boom Room, and the dude laughed at me, man. The man <laughs> laughed, like, and kept making jokes for about five minutes. And I put a smile on, and, man, I, ooh, Ooh, <laughs> it ain't no fun when the rabbit get the gun. I'm gonna tell you that. But that didn't do nothing but push me. Cause listen, man, I done had to stand in front of these people and tell them, man, I appreciate y'all coming out, man. I ain't get drafted. That's the most embarrassing time in my life. Yeah. Hey, this 
this ain't nothing. Tell yeah. me I can't get on the right. Ra- cool. I'm gonna be back. That's your rock bottom. Yeah, that, yeah. I can't get no further yeah. down. You know what I mean? You got to take me off this earth. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? But to laugh at me, man, you ain't doing them a point gasoline on the fire, man. That's so it. We could go for uh, oh, without another question, hour. Because it's really we uh, really get into it. I, you know I, what I mean? I do have to get upstairs. Oh uh, no, you know. Uh, or Buck Rising might call me crying. That's cool. Let Buck find somebody. But else I'm gonna do something. Uh, I'm gonna do something a little unorthodox. <laughs> I don't know if this if, if you've ever been through this. Um, I right, talked to him. So you, and every 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 time you guys have a guest on 3HL, you put him in the boom boom room. Right. I don't know if you have ever been put in the boom boom room, <laughs> no, but we're gonna do that here. That sound you just heard was the produced <laughs> sound of a big metal door closing shut that Brett Bachelor put uh, into the podcast after we wrapped up here. Now, when you get into the boom boom room, the door's locked behind you. The only way out of the boom boom room is to answer every question truthfully <laughs> to the best of your ability. Do you agree to these terms? <laughs> I ain't got no choice. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> Biggest basketball influence as a kid? Ooh. Um. Anthony Mason, Carlos Rogers, Ron Mercer, Dante Jones, Hal McClain, um, Calvin Peters, Coach Fitzgerald, Big Terry Reynolds, Big Wayne. Um, and I'm just saying that you talking about it as a kid, you know. Mm-hmm. Um Man, Magic Johnson, Isaiah Thomas, those were those were it for me. Those were my mom, of course, but that goes without saying. So you can go one on one with any Hall of Famer in basketball history. Who do you have the best chance against? I got the best chance against any of them. I don't give, I don't give a damn who it is. Like man, <laughs> who they got the best chance against? They might want to figure it out another way. Well, if you ask me, who would I like to play Hall of Famer? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we'll say that. Kevin Garnett. Love KG. Most notable teammate or opponent in Europe that listeners might know on the podcast. Whether someone that played college ball in your era, after your era, anybody that comes to mind. That's tough, man. Notable guys. Um I caught um Marco Bellinelli. Um, we came up the same era. Um, Danilo Gallinari. Um uh What's the big uh big Porzingis? Okay. Um called Porzingis in my second or last year. Um there's quite a few, man. This is man, like when, let me say this. For people that wonder what happened to the college guys that were that you thought were stars or whatever it may be, man, they would have made a good living overseas, man. And I promise you that same stardom that they had in college, they yeah. took it overseas and pretty much did the exact same thing with it. Um, it was it was some it was some really good players. I played against some great guys. But Randolph Childress played on this team, and that's 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 my guy, man. When you talk about a guy that really set me on my path, Randolph Childress. I'm gonna let you go with this. Okay, this is a Saturday Down South article. It's called the Ten Most Hated SEC Hoopers of All Time. Okay, big bold letters. Ron Slay, one of the ten. Word. The SEC hoops version of the Pistons McFilthy and McNasty slay, jabbered, cajoled, and hustled his way to 1,569 career points. Physical, loud, and always present, Slay somehow earns a few extra points for his omnipresent headband. At least unlike future ball Wayne Chisholm, he did wear it around his head rather than on top of his head. Got you sandwiched right after Tony Harris, of course, Ooh. Tennessee, okay. and Teddy DuPay of Florida. What, what, what's your reaction when you hear that? Oh, I like it. Um, I will say those guys had four-year careers. Mine was cut short by ACL tear. Um, so that, that, that 15 would have probably been about 2,000 easily. But, you know, who's counting? Slay, thanks for doing this, man. I right, man, appreciate it, man. Anytime we got to come back and have a continuation. Oh, man. we're gonna have we're gonna have a continuation on Ron Slay's media career yeah, now that we've man. done the basketball part. Yeah. Didn't get even close to to enough of that, so no we'll question. do it again. But appreciate you being the first guest of this thing. We're gonna have some fun with it, and yeah, uh, yeah man, thanks again. Enjoyed it, man. Hey, man, y'all look out for it inside the zone, Panzeca. For Ron Slay, I'm Lucas Panzeca. We'll catch you on the next episode of Inside Zone. Go Vols, though.